Jesus. Thank you for being here this morning. So we have Kelly, our uh, very first time guest here today. Exodus chapter 1, verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service when they made them serve was with rigor, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And for the next few moments, because God loves you, the Lord's going to talk to us about, let my people go. Hallelujah. Let my people go. Would you lift your voices in the hands of God? Would you praise the Lord? Hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I lift up your name and exalt you. Give my voice is a little worse than normal, which is usually pretty bad anyhow. But you may be seated. At the time of our Bible text, God's people were enslaved. <coughs> they were enslaved in Egypt. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve, the Bible said, with rigor. Now, it's not a word that we use a lot, but in the Hebrew, it means to literally break apart. And it means that, that they made the Israelites to serve with harshness, severity, and cruelty. The Egyptians did all they could to make life harsh, severe, cruel. The Bible says that they made their life bitter. 
I pray that God would never let any of us become bitter. But they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, long hours of back-breaking work, brutally enforced with the whip and with the lash. But that wasn't enough. After all of that, then the king of Egypt did the unthinkable. He ordered all Israelite baby boys to be murdered, <coughs> aborted by the midwives. So it wasn't just making life bitter for the adults and for the people, but Pharaoh came after the kids. The people of Israel were enslaved, they were oppressed, and they were depressed. And the Bible says that they begin to groan, they begin to cry, they begin to repent. And the Bible says that God heard their groaning. And when God heard their groaning, God sent Moses, the man of God, to command Pharaoh, let my people go. Satan is a hard taskmaster. He's a hard taskmaster. Right. He lures people to come over into his territory with promises. Promises of plenty. Promises of visions of grandeur. And promises of lots of fun for everyone. He promises no rules. He says, no restraints. He says, no responsibilities. There'll never be a dull moment if you'll come down to Egypt. Just come down to where I am, where I have control, where I rule. You'll always have lots of fun. There'll never be any responsibilities and there will be plenty. I found over the years that Satan makes fun of and belittles God's laws. Right. As if they are the ten suggestions instead of the ten commandments. He likes to make fun of the word of God and he especially thrives on making fun of people who keep God's law as though living for God is boring. He tries to make living for God look unenviable and undesirable. The informed, the enlightened, he says, will come over to Egypt and enjoy his pleasures where there are no boundaries. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, beware that when the devil tries to tell you he's got a better plan where there are no boundaries and no responsibilities, you have to understand that that worm has a hook in it. Right. The devil whispers, Psst. Satan does not tell you that people who shirk responsibility may really be shunning success. He does not tell you that privilege and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. That when God 
writes opportunity on one side of the door, he writes responsibility on the other side. So that when a person shirks their responsibility, they also lose their privileges. There are no privileges without responsibility. But Satan is always trying to make it look like living for God is somehow more difficult. Surely you would rather spend your time in the hospital or in a court somewhere or in a rehab somewhere or doing some of the other fun things that the devil has in mind for you. Somehow or other, he tries to make good look bad and bad look good. And responsibility, that just looks like something that is to be avoided at all costs. However, if a person continues to listen to Satan's deceptive voice, it's not long before Satan's promises are all totally broken. Just as Pharaoh's promises to Joseph were ultimately broken. There was a Pharaoh who made Joseph promises. But by the time of the day of Moses, those promises had been broken. Right. And the life of plenty and ease had become a life of poverty and stress and sorrow and death and sickness. Don't be deceived. There will be responsibility as long as there is breath. But hear this. Jesus says, All ye who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is the truth. You will not get out of life without a burden. You will not get out of life without a responsibility. But if you will take the yoke of Jesus upon you, what that means is that Jesus will come alongside of you and yoke with you to pull your burden. Right. It's tough to wake up at night far away from your covenant relationship with God, separated from strength and power that was one time yours. Hearing the mirthless laughter of the enemy, who by now is the only one laughing and the only one having fun right. at your <coughs> expense. Amen. There's only one voice laughing, and that's the voice of the devil, when he has lured you into Egypt. And it's all at your expense. Just as all Pharaoh's promises were absolutely broken, and the Israelites were turned into slaves, Satan's promises are always absolutely broken, and those who fall into his trap are, without a question, enslaved, oppressed, and depressed. In Satan's scheme, Life becomes more and more bitter until that person is under the hard bondage and they are forced, this is what the Bible uses for a term, forced to serve with rigor. Forced to serve with harshness, severity, and cruelty. Right. Hear me today. The chains of heaven are usually too small to be broken are too small to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. Right. You don't notice them at first. When Satan begins to put his chains upon you at first, it doesn't seem like much. It's just a little and it's not noticeable. But by the time you notice it, they are too strong to be broken. And then, and then he always comes for the kids. Yeah. You might as well look at me because I'm looking at you. He always comes for the kids next. He never is satisfied just to have you. 
He's never satisfied just to have the parent. He always will go for the kids to the third and fourth generation. Always. It was bad enough when he was picking on you. But he doesn't just want you, you understand. He wants your kids. Every time Satan manages to enslave parents, he always orders, almost immediately, the destruction of their children. A dad's habit will be passed on to the son, and the son will pass that same habit on to the next generation. A mom's habit will be passed on to the child. The child will pass it on to the next generation. That's because when Satan comes for a person, he always comes for them and anyone who would be called a child in their family. The people of Israel were in slavery. It looked permanent. No escape. Hard bondage. Forced to serve with rigor with harshness, severity, and cruelty. But while still bound in slavery and in the bowels of Egypt, God's people began to groan. They began to cry out, Oh my God, I can't handle this pain anymore. They began to cry out, Oh God, save us. Oh God, deliver us. They began to repent. Folks, I appreciate the fact that there are several, looks like 23 baptized, and 27 filled with the Holy Ghost. But there's another category that we do not list on the wall that is equally as important. It is the category of repentance. Total and complete repentance. <coughs> Jump your hands with me. Let's praise the Lord for a moment. My Lord, God, 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 God, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Total unconditional repentance is the first step to work freedom. You know, God doesn't just save you because you're tired, you're weary, you want God to take away the pain. God saves us when we realize that we have sinned against Him. And we begin to groan. And we begin to ask God for forgiveness. I think the reason some people do not successfully live for God is that they did not spend enough time repenting over the things that they had done wrong. If I tell God I'm sorry for something and I begin to weep and cry over my mistake and I begin to give it to God, you know, it's going to be a whole lot easier for me not to fall back into that. If I go around the altar repentance and I just go to the waters of baptism and I just receive the Holy Ghost, then there's some things that I really didn't grieve over. There's some things I didn't lay to rest. There's some things that I never totally put under the blood. And that happens at the altar of repentance. Right. See, the blood was sprinkled on all the furniture in the tabernacle. There's blood applied at repentance. There's blood applied at baptism. There's blood applied at the influence of the Holy Ghost. You need all three. Right. Somebody say praise God. Praise God. God heard the groaning repentance of the Israelites and sent Moses, the man of God, to get in Pharaoh's face and say, Let my people go. You know, one thing I love about God, there's many things I love about Him, but one thing I love about God is that once you start living for God and you make a mistake, God doesn't walk up, slap you across the head, and say, you are so stupid, and then slam you up against the wall. He is faithful and just to forgive us. If we confess, God, I failed you. I'm sorry. Forgive me, God. He doesn't say, well, stupid. You should have known better. No, he's never done that to me, and he will never do that to you. He always opens his arms wide like a loving parent and says, you know, I'm so glad you saw that. I'm so glad you recognized that wasn't good, and now come here. I want to give you a hug. And I forgive you. Every time he forgives. Every time. And so, when they cried, 
God said, let my people go. I thank God for the gift of repentance. Well, Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. And the other day at district conference, I was reminded of something that I had seen in the Word of God many years ago. And I want to share with you something about this. God sent ten plagues upon Egypt. And he decided he was going to cause Pharaoh to turn around, to do what he was supposed to do. And so when Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I would serve him? God began to send ten plagues upon Egypt. The first one, the Bible said, he turned the waters of Egypt into blood. The streams and rivers and ponds and all pools were turned to blood. Each one of these plagues were directed at an idol that the Egyptians served. Now, these plagues were not just for the Egyptians. They were also to show the Israelites that there's only one true God and that the gods of the Egyptians were nothing but idols. Right. And so he directed every one of those plagues at one or more of the Egyptian idols. Right. For instance, the Egyptians served an idol by the name of Osiris, who they said the river now was the blood of Osiris. And so God said, I'm going to show you that Osiris is just an idol and that I am the Lord God. And so he turned the river Nile into blood. Right. By the time of the end of that first plague, the Egyptians couldn't stand Osiris. They hated the thought of Osiris. They couldn't stand the fact that the river was running with blood. And God showed the Egyptians and the Israelites that there's only one God. And Osiris was nothing but an idol. The second was a plague of frogs. The blood had been barely gone when suddenly the Nile was teeming with frogs. Frogs, frogs, and more frogs in the palace, in the bedrooms, on the bed, in the kitchens, in the soup, in the frying pans, frogs in the chairs, frogs covering the floors. You couldn't walk without stepping on frogs, lots of frogs. It was gross. And sometimes we wonder, well, why would God do that? Because the Egyptians served a goddess by the name of Hect, H-E-Q-T. And she was an idol that had the body of a woman and the head of a frog. And she was considered the goddess of fertility. But by the time the second plague was over, the Egyptians were saying, away with it. Because everywhere you looked, there were frogs. And so the Bible says that their frogs died in their houses and in the courtyards and in the fields, and they were piled in the heaps, and the land literally reeked from dead, rotting frogs. And God said to the people of Israel, Het is not your God. I, Jehovah, am your God. And to the Egyptians, Het cannot save you. I am Jehovah. The Egyptians were getting a healthy respect for God. And the Israelites were learning Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hallelujah. The third plague was a plague of lice. God turned the dust of Egypt. Think about this. He turned the dust of Egypt into lice. Now, folks, there's lots of dust in Egypt. And he turned the dust of Egypt into lice and all of a sudden everybody was itching and scratching. I have to call a nurse in here in a moment. I see you all scratching. But there was something about this plague that maybe you do not know. There was a law in ancient Egypt that if a person had lice, they were not allowed into the public places, especially into the temples of worship. And God shut down all idol worship with the third plague. All idol worship was shut down throughout the nation of Egypt when God sent the plague of lice. And he said, you know, all your gods are nothing. I shut their temples down with disdain. I am Jehovah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fourth plague was a plague of flies. 
The fifth, disease upon the Egyptian livestock. So that all the cattle of Egypt died. Not one of the cattle, however, belonging to the Israelites died. The sixth plague was a plague of boils and sores upon the Egyptians and upon their beasts. And the seventh was a hailstorm with hailstones so large that any man or beast not under shelter was killed. The hail beat down everything growing in the fields. And the Bible said it broke every tree. Can you imagine that? A hailstorm so bad and the hailstorm so large that every tree in Egypt was broken. And any man who failed to get under shelter was killed. And any beast who was left out in the field was killed. It was horrific. The ninth plague was a plague of darkness that could be felt. And the tenth plague finally broke the will of Pharaoh when God took his oldest child in death as well as the oldest child of every Egyptian family. Isn't it the way it is with sin? Yes. Sin always hurts more than the perpetrator. All the families of Egypt, the oldest child died, as well as Pharaoh, who was resisting God. Would you lift your hands with me and let's praise the Lord. My Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for life. Thank you for life the I'm going to tell you a few of the deals that Pharaoh tried to cut with God's people. There were some compromises that Pharaoh said, look, let's compromise on this. I will offer you this deal. It was after the fourth plague of flies that Pharaoh made his first offer. It's found in Exodus chapter 8, verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. All right. I see you want to go and you want to go badly. So I'll tell you what I'll let you do. I'll let you sacrifice to your God if you'll just stay in the land. That was his first compromise. Beware, beware, beware. When the devil offers you a deal, there's always a hook in that worm. Right. He said, you go ahead and worship God. I don't care. You go ahead and go to church. Go praise your God. But just don't change anything. Don't change your address. Just stay right where you are. Live in Egypt. Stay here in the land of Egypt and I'll let you worship God. You see, the devil doesn't care how high you jump. He doesn't care how radically you dance if you don't change anything. If life stays the same and the only difference is now is that you go to church. Come on. That's exactly what the devil is wanting you to do. He says, you go ahead and serve the Lord, but serve him in the land. Stay in the land of Egypt. You can worship. You don't have to change anything. You can worship, but just stay here in the land. I want you to notice what Moses answered in Exodus 8, 26. And Moses said, It is not meet to do so. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. We're not going to stay in the land. We're going to go three days' journey. That three days, as you know, is very much used in the Bible. Three is the blood was placed on two doorposts and on the lintel. They're going to go three days' journey into the wilderness. There's going to have to be a death, burial, and a resurrection if you're going to get out of Egypt. There's going to have to be a repentance. There's going to have to be a, a water baptism in the name of Jesus. You're going to have to go three days' journey. You're going to need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
You can't just stay in Egypt land and worship God. It doesn't do any good to say, I'm a Christian, how about you? And not come out of Egypt. You're going to have to go three days out of Egypt. Death, burial, resurrection, repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus, the influence of the Holy Ghost. And you have to leave the land of Egypt, folks, because life becomes bitter in Egypt. He promise you, promises all the pleasure and fun, but I promise you, he doesn't show the end result of what happens if you stay in his jurisdiction. He has jurisdiction over Egypt. That's why he wants you to stay in Egypt. When that didn't work, in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 28, Pharaoh offered his second compromise. He said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. When Moses and Aaron said, no way, we're not staying here, we're going three days into the, into the wilderness, then Pharaoh said, well, I'll tell you what, I agree. I'll let you go. Let's make a deal. Come on, let's make a deal. Let's compromise here. I'll let you go, but don't go very far. Stay on the border. Stay close where I can reach out and grab you when I want to, where I can cause you great trouble and great sorrow. You go ahead and serve the Lord your God, but don't go, too, don't go very far. Just stay close by. Satan loves for God's people to leave Egypt and then hang around the border of Egypt. Come on. Many years ago, you remember, this happened more than once. People keeping exotic pets. Sometimes I read about it. And one time in particular, a lady had a Siberian tiger. And a child came walking by his cage, and unbeknownst, the, the tiger had been digging under the fence. And when the child walked by, the tiger reached out with his front paw, grabbed a hold of it, curled his paw around the leg of the child, and pulled the child under the fence and mauled it to death. I'm telling you that Satan is very, very happy if you will just worship the Lord, but don't go very far. Just stay close. Close where he can grab you. Close where there's not a whole lot of prayer. And, and close where there's not a whole lot of commitment. And close where there's not a whole lot of dedication. Don't go very far away. The third compromise was found in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 8. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. They said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds, will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto him, Let the Lord be with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is upon you. Not so! Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord. And he drove them out from his presence. Pharaoh said, Okay, you go ahead and go, but I'll tell you what. Just the men go. Leave your families in Egypt. Just go ahead and go. Parent, listen to me. It's not enough for us to, to be saved from Egypt. We need to take our family with us. It's going to take effort. It's going to take exertion. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take responsibility. I won't lie to you. It takes all those things. But commitment and responsibility are one side of the door. And on the other side of the door is written the word opportunity. And when you accept responsibility, when you leave out commitment, you also leave out the door of opportunity. Not only for you, but for your children to be saved. So Satan says, leave your families in Egypt. But Moses said, no, sir, we will go with our young and with our old. We'll go with our sons and with our daughters. We will go with our flocks and with our herds. We are taking our family with us. I want everybody to lift your hands with me now. And let's say, God, in the name of Jesus, I intend to take my family with me into the promised land. God, I intend for my family to be saved. I refuse to go alone. I refuse to leave them behind. 
I am taking them with me. I will not stay back, but neither will my children in Jesus' name. Finally, after the ninth plague, and just before the final plague of death, when Pharaoh, by the way, would capitulate, Pharaoh offered one last compromise. Now look, that's the way the devil operates. Notice how he operates. He's ready to fold and he knows it. He's ready to surrender and he knows it. He's ready to capitulate and he knows it. But he says, I'm going to offer them one last deal. Because they don't know how bad I'm hurting. They don't know how ready I am to surrender. They don't know how bad I want them out of Egypt. They don't know how much destruction they've done to my kingdom. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer them one last compromise to see if they will take it. I wonder how many people were so close to an ultimate victory for them and for their family when they accepted a compromise from the devil. Come on, it's the truth. It's after the ninth plague. It's just before the tenth plague. And Pharaoh is offering a compromise. Exodus 10.24, And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So now he's backed up and he said, Look, I understand. You want to take your kids. All right. But leave your flocks and your herds in Egypt. Just go ahead. Take your wife. Take your children. But leave your flocks and your herds in Egypt. Don't take your flocks and herds with you. What was he saying? He was saying, Leave your finances in Egypt. Leave your finances in Egypt, but take your children and your wife. Pharaoh knew that wouldn't work. He knew that they would have to have those finances and that the finances would draw them back to Egypt. It was a deadly plot. There are people today who still fall for that same compromise of Pharaoh, who want to live for God but can't trust God with their tithe who want to serve the Lord, but are afraid to surrender their finances to God, afraid what it might cost them, not realizing that if they leave their finances in Egypt where their treasure is, there will their heart be also. Right. Somehow Moses knew that if he compromised with Pharaoh, all would be lost. And when it comes to living for God, hear me, Compromise is always costly and sometimes fatal. Today, one of the hardest things for people in our culture to understand is he who abandons, abandons himself to God will never be abandoned by God. Right. It's hard for people in our culture to wrap their mind around the fact that if you will simply abandon yourself to God, God will never abandon you. Why is it that we are so afraid to surrender totally to God? What are we afraid that God's going to ask for? What are we afraid that God is going to call for? What is it that we're afraid He's going to ask us? And why are we so afraid to totally dedicate ourselves to the one who has nail scars in His hands and a scar in His side? and nail prints in his feet. Why are we so afraid to make a total de dedication to God that says, God, whatever you want, I'm willing to do. And whatever you want, that's what I want. And Lord, I'm going to live for you and serve you. I ask you, God, to help me to hate what you hate and help me to love what you love. And I so dedicate my life to you right now. It doesn't matter anymore what I want, but what you want. Why are we so afraid to dedicate completely and totally to him? When in reality, if you will abandon yourself to God, you will never be abandoned by God. It's a compromise of the devil that was offered way back in Pharaoh's day. Go ahead and serve the Lord, but leave your kids. Go ahead and serve the Lord, but leave your money. Go ahead and serve the Lord, but you that are men, you just go. Go ahead and serve the Lord, but stay in the land. Go ahead and serve the Lord, but don't go very far. 
All those compromises lead back into slavery. All those compromises lead back to where you were. You will have wasted everything you've ever accomplished for God if you listen to the compromising voice of the enemy. Adam and Eve ate themselves out of house and home. It was just a compromise. Just a compromise. But it will take the blessedness of God away from your life. Oh, hear me today. Here's a paradox to remember. We die by living to ourselves. We die by living to ourselves. We live by dying to ourselves. There's a paradox to remember. We die by living unto ourselves. We live by dying unto ourselves. It's not what I want. It's not what I like. But when I try to please God, when I try to serve the Lord, when I try to do my best to give my life to Him, I begin living. Right. Folks, Christ is not valued at all unless He is valued above all. Hallelujah. He's not valued at all unless He is valued above all. Here's what the Word of God says in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 20. It says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey His voice, that thou mayest cleave unto Him, for He is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. Notice what the Word of God says. Love the Lord thy God. Obey his voice. Cleave unto him. What does it mean when it says cleave unto him? That, that means like a man holding on to a, a broken part of a, of a ship that's been tossed in the waves. He's cleaving to it. It means you have both arms wrapped around something and you're not going to let go for anything. Cleave to the Lord. Love the Lord. Obey His voice. Cleave unto Him. Why? He is thy life. I've been pastoring 36 years. And I've watched some people as they come to these, which we always do, come to crossroads in life. And I see them stand and get up on their tiptoes and they look down this way and then they look down this way and they're pondering, what should I do? Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. What shall I do? I've seen some who come to this crossroads in life and they said, no compromise. Satan, I don't trust you any further than I can throw you. I will not compromise. It's Jesus all the way for me. And it looked like they were actually throwing some things away in their life that maybe were good. But they always come out on the other side victorious and rejoicing. I've watched others who come to the same crossroads in life and just before the devil capitulated, just before he said, all right, drat, I can't believe it. I tried everything I could and you made up your mind, so I'm out of here. Just before you were to have the greatest victory and they were to have the greatest victory of their life, Satan offered one last compromise. I have stood in the driveway of a home with tears running down my face and said, you're making a big mistake. Oh, you're trying to scare us, aren't you, preacher? No, you're making a big mistake. <clears throat> Anytime the man of God begins to weep over you, it is not a good idea. When God caused Samuel to weep all night one night, the next morning he stepped out into the street, halted 
a victory procession, looked up at Saul, who was riding his fine charger, and said, Saul, have you obeyed the voice of the Lord? He said, of course I have. What kind of question is that? Of course I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. He said, who is this? Who is this man riding beside you? <coughs> and what is the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you for being king. So Samuel's face was bleary. Tears had run down his face all night. He wept over Saul. He loved Saul. But Saul had made a decision to compromise with the enemy. Samuel was a prophet. He looked ahead in time and no doubt he could see Saul's demise. Saul would have his head decapitated from his body and it would be nailed to the castle wall of the enemy along with his kids. Hey! Talking to you this morning. When the devil decides to take somebody out, he will try to give you a compromise and he will try to get you to listen to his last little reasoning. And you have to stand up and say, oh no, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I have been called of God to serve the Lord and do the will of God and God comes first in my life. And you know what? I'm not going to concede one square inch. I'm not going to give one inch to you, devil, because I know you are never satisfied. If I give you what you're asking for today, you'll ask for more tomorrow. And if I give you what you're asking for tomorrow, you will ask more the next day. No, I've drawn the line in the sand. Give me Jesus. I can tell you that on one side, I've watched people who have refuse to compromise with the enemy and live for God with all their hearts. And life has not always been easy, but it's always been victorious. Right. And they always come out on the other side. Hallelujah. I've watched other people say, well, you know what, I think I'll just, I'm not going to do it all the way like, you know, that they do it. I think I'm just going to give it a little bit here, give it a little bit there. I think I'll just, those people always end up back in Egypt. And the latter state is always worse than the former state. Sometimes God reveals something to the man of God. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you look at him and you're like, uh-oh. He knows exactly. And sometimes I might. But other times I might not know a thing. And there's nobody as blind as I am unless God turns on the light. I'll never forget one time, many years ago, a fine couple were attending this church and they made some decisions that were going to take them away from God. And so I, I have a pastor's heart. I went to them and I said, Sir, ma'am, this is going to cost you your marriage. And that lady nearly attacked me. She said, well, if you think that me and my husband are ever going to be separated, divorced, I got news for you. She shook her head and they walked out. But it happened just like the Lord showed me it was going to happen. And today somewhere that man He's still around town, and I, I see him, and I always am kind to him. I want to shake his hand. I want to tell him I'm thinking about him, praying for him. And he is all alone. Folks, hear me today. Satan offers a compromise. If you'll just stay in the land, go ahead and worship God. Or if you won't go very far, don't get too radical about this. Don't make a full commitment. You know what I mean? Just make a, a 75% commitment. That's pretty good. You're not half bad. Well, if that won't work, then 
Just don't get your family to involve. Keep your family out of it, all right? You just serve God yourself. Don't, don't ask your family to join you. And if that won't work, the final solution is, well, leave your finances in Egypt. Because he knows where your treasure is. That's where your heart is also. If you leave your heart in France, San Francisco, you're going to go back to San Francisco at some point. Wherever you leave your heart, that's where you're going to go back. But as for me and my house, I refuse to wake up in some, some dark, dark place with the hounds of hell baying at my heels, saying, Ha, 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 you used to be a man of God, didn't you? How you feeling now? That's so good. Hey, Samson, what's going on now? Pushing the, the style. I'm grinding out the grain. Hey, Samson, you used to be used of God. Yes, I, I was. Aren't you the guy that picked up the gates of the city and carried them out? Oh, yes, that was a minor revival when God blessed me and the anointing of God came upon me. And, and I picked up the gates of the city and I carried them out and I flung them and I, I walked on. And, and Samson, did you not kill? A thousand with a jawbone of a donkey. Yes, that was a great day. You see, they had bound me and put ropes upon me. But when the presence of God came upon me, I snapped the ropes and I reached out and I grabbed the skeletal jaw of a donkey and the anointing of God. And I worked together and a thousand Philistines were killed that day. Where are you at now? Down here in the dungeon. How come, Sandy boy? How come? As I listen to the voice of the devil. I'm so sorry. Well, what'd you do, Sammy boy? Well, I, I got the consorting with the enemy. And I, they took me and they put my eyes out. I can't get rid of the vision in my head. The last thing I saw was the hideous, glaring faces of my enemy. Laughing at me, poking at me. That was the last thing I saw. I haven't seen anything since. I'm living like a subhuman. Oh, I, I thought you were going to have a great time down there in Philistia. Oh, it started out to be a good time. I had some one night stands. I had some times of pleasure that I never dreamed it would end this way. Folks, hear me. Don't listen to the compromise of the enemy. God has his hand upon you. And even now, the devil is ready to capitulate. There's something getting ready to happen that's going to affect you and your family in a very positive way. God is ready to do something, a miracle that's going to touch you and your family in such a positive way. And the devil knows it, so he's offering one last compromise, hoping you'll take the bait. God has already sent a man of God into your life. And he is saying, let my people go. And I want to tell you something. If Jesus doesn't give it to you, you don't want it. Whatever you have in your life, if Jesus didn't give it to you, you don't want it. Because every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. From the Father of lights. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turn. But every other gift is just a bomb sent in your name, waiting for you to open it, and it's going to go off. Let Jesus have his way in your life. Bow your heads with me now. I'm trying to follow the leadership of the Lord. There is not one person in this building right now that God has not called. There's not one person in this building right now that God has not called you. You just have to make up your mind. Are you going to accept the devil's compromise and turn and go back into Egypt again and ruin everything for yourself and for your kids? Or are you going to say, take this whole world, but give me Jesus and I'm all done with Satan's compromises? He's a compromising genius. He knows how to make 
Egypt appealing? Is there anybody in this house today that God is talking to? I have basically risen off my sick bed to preach this message this morning because I love you. Where are you this morning? God is calling you and you have to have a very important decision to make and it's just this. Will you totally surrender to God or will you not? God wants a total, unconditional surrender. Not one with reservations, not one with exceptions or exclusions. He wants all the keys to your life. And in return, he says, take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. Take my yoke upon you. My load is light. I'll yoke together with you. I'll help you pull the burdens of life. And when it's all said and done, if you make the right choice of leaving Egypt, getting as far as you away from Egypt as you can, taking your children with you and taking your finance with you and having your head on straight, God promises you that things will work out. Anything less than a total and a complete dedication is devilish and will destroy. I close with this. I read somewhere that General Washington was approaching one of the fiercest battles of his campaign. He and his troops had crossed over a bridge and as they were nearing the battle, one of his officers came and asked whether or not to burn the bridge behind them. The great General Washington looked toward the battle, then looked back to where they had come from, and then back toward the battle, and this was his answer. Burn the bridge. It is either victory or death. Burn the bridge. It's either victory or death. Somebody right now has got to make that decision to burn the bridges behind you. Isn't it something how the devil will always try to leave a bridge standing between you and Egypt? But at the end of the day, he's the only one laughing in Egypt. I wouldn't be preaching this message today if it was too late. If it was too late, I wouldn't be preaching this. But I sense right now that there's an opportunity. The devil's ready to capitulate and your family's about to receive a great miracle. Is there anybody in this building that would rise to your feet and say, I'm all done with Satan's compromises. I'm all done with it. God help me. I'm all done with it. I've got too much good that God's done for me. There's too many good things that God is doing. I have too much precious cargo on board. I know that a few times I've gotten myself into a a little bit of a tight situation over the years in flying. And on a few occasions, I've had the air traffic controller say something like, November 5566 five, Romeo, how many souls are on board? I know why they're asking. I repeat back, number 5566 Romeo has X amount of souls on board. What you do today will not only influence your future, but it will absolutely determine the future of the souls who are on board. And I hear the voice of God querying. How many souls on board? You have to answer. And what should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? It's quiet in here.
I preach with a pretty low voice. I don't have much of a voice left. But I feel the deep moving of God's presence. And I'm going to ask you all, if you would please, to rise to your feet. Sister Jenny, you can play something. I know there are some that become furious when the preacher preaches like this. I don't preach it to make you furious. I just see the day coming when there's going to be an accounting. You're going to give an account. You need to go three days' journey into the wilderness. You need to repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Anything short of that is short of Canaan. You need to go out of Egypt with the blood over your doorpost. You need to go through the cloud and through the sea and be baptized in the cloud and in the sea if you're going to leave Egypt. And if you're going to leave Egypt, don't stay by its borders. Get as far from Egypt as you can. God is talking to somebody and I'm going to ask you to acknowledge it. If God's talking to you, I want you to come and stand here at the front of this church today. If God is talking to your heart, if he's talking to your heart, I want you to come and stand.